freedom. And uh, the Chinese sent tanks, actually crushed the number of students. This kid got out, stood in front of a row of tanks, and started yelling, we're Chinese like you, all we want is freedom, uh, don't kill us. And to his credit, so that's her, the tank commander turned around. We don't know what happened to this kid. Uh, they, he was probably arrested, probably killed, but it was an inc incredible act of, of bravery, of courage. So that's a physical hero. The guy who stopped the abuse at Abu Ghraib was this guy, the most ordinary guy in the world, Joe Darby, G.I. Joe Darby. His buddy showed him a CD with all these horrible images, the ones you saw, plus hundreds and hundreds more. At first he laughed, he said, it's ridiculous, guys pile in a pyramid, isn't that funny? And then he saw more and more, he said, this is horrible. We are supposed to be bringing democracy to these people, we're bringing humiliation. And he took the CD and gave it to a senior investigating officer, knowing his buddies were gonna get in trouble, knowing if they got in trouble, they were gonna get trouble for him. He had to be put in hiding, protective custody for three years. Then they had to put his mother and his wife in protective custody because everybody wanted to kill them. Not only his battalion, but people in their little hometown, I think in Pennsylvania. Because they said he humiliated the military. That is the messenger, rather than the message was what was terrible. I mentioned Stanford Prison that he ended after five days. I didn't tell you the real reason why. It's, it's 10 o'clock, Thursday night, and I was going to invite a number of young, young graduate students, young assistant professors to come down and interview everybody, okay? To get a fresh, who, people who knew nothing about the study. And one of the people who came down on Thursday night was this woman, Christina Maslach. I had just started dating her. She had been my student. She was now an assistant professor at Berkeley. And, and she comes down. It gets better, it gets better. She comes down. And it's 10 o'clock, and I look at my schedule as prison superintendent, and at 10 o'clock is the last toilet run. Prisoners have to go to the toilet at 10 o'clock. If they don't, then they have to go to the toilet in, in, in a bucket in their cell. So the guards line up the prisoners, put bags over their heads, chain their feet together, have them put their hand on each other's show, yelling at them, screaming at them. I look up, and I check off, it's a 10 o'clock toilet run. I say, hey, Chris, look at this. And she begins to tear up and runs out. And I run after, I say, what's wrong with you? She says, I, I don't want to look at that. And I say, what kind of psychologist are you? What is that, feminist reaction, da da da, all this thing. And she said, it's terrible what you're doing to those boys. They're not prisoners, they're, they're boys and you are responsible, it's terrible. And then the second slap in the face, she said, if this is the real you, I'm not sure I want to continue a relationship with you because I thought you were kind and loving and this person is a monster. And so at that moment, I said, oh, you, she's right. We've got to end the study. I had become the prison superintendent, not just the principal investigator. And so it wasn't I was cruel, I was simply indifferent to the suffering of the prisoners. Because if you're the prison superintendent, who do you care about? You care about the guards, they're your staff. Prisoners come and go. When prison breaks down, I didn't say, oh my God, the prisoner brought, we send him to student health, and then we bring in another prisoner. And so I had lost my compassion in that role. The good news is, uh, that we got married the next summer at Stanford. <laughs> and and we, we, we are living happily ever after. But, so situations have the power, we're almost finished, right? situations have the power to do three things. The very same situation that inflames the hostile imagination of some people to get them to do bad things. That same situation can inspire the heroic imagination in others. Or in most of us, it makes us guilty of the evil of inaction. We follow your mother's advice. What does she say? Don't get involved, mind your own business. If you do that, you're gonna live forever. But you have to say, no mama, humanity is my business, I must be involved. So the evil of inaction. Dante tells us the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of great moral crisis maintain th their neutrality. Uh, uh, British statesman Edmund Burke says, all that matters for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. It's a lovely cartoon. Flying around all day just won't cut it. Sooner or later, you're gonna have to fight some evil. So to be a hero, you have to act. You have to, it's, it's not enough to think about it, you have to actually do it. So psychology of heroism is, we're developing new courses starting in the fifth grade, we want to run it through the whole curriculum, of teaching kids about heroism. Heroism in your family, heroism in your community, heroism in, in your nation. Think about what a heroic act is, have you done any, should you be doing any, developing scrapbooks, and teaching them specific skills. All heroes have to be deviant. So you get them role play, being deviant for a day. And the whole point is, 
internalizing the fact that I am a hero in waiting. We know if I tell you you're likely to be, that you're more, you're more generous than most people. The next week when there's a blood drive, he's more likely to give blood than him. Two weeks later, if there's a charity drive, he's more likely to give money. So we know that internalizing self-beliefs, that you are a certain kind of person, works in some situation. We think that internalizing a belief that I'm a hero in waiting, an everyday hero, an ordinary person, will also do that. Heroes are ordinary people whose social action is extraordinary. It is the act that's important and not the person. So I'm trying to stick with my situational approach. Heroes are not special. Well, Nelson Mandela, you know, they're the exception to the rule, but I'm saying most heroes are like Joe Darby. Chris Mazak, as much as I love her, that was her heroic deed. She never did anything before. She'd probably never do anything again. Because she, she and Darby are never going to be in that situation. So the other thing is you act on behalf of others. So it has to be sociocentric rather than egocentric. And that's hard to give up egocentrism. And I want to end with this incredible story that some of you have heard about. It's a young man, African-American man, standing on New York subway with 75 other people, and a white guy falls on the tracks, across the track. The train is coming, going to cut him in half. And what he does is he jumps down when everybody else is there. He has a reason not to be involved. He's got his two little daughters. He turns them over to the stranger and he jumps down. And he survives, barely, you'll see in a moment. And what he says is, I did what anyone could do. No big deal jumping on tracks, but I did what everyone ought to do. That's the moral imperative. Okay? So in all the people who were interviewed, who helped Christians, who helped Jews, every single one of them, thousands, said, I, I wasn't a hero, I wasn't special. But they all say, I did what everyone should have done at that time. So let's just look very briefly, and then we'll be near the end, of that special kind of hero. York City subway, it's hard enough finding someone who will give up his seat to a stranger, let alone be willing to give up his life for one. The train was coming in like, like, like that. And it happened just... 50-year-old Wesley Autry, a construction worker and Navy veteran, was standing on a subway platform with his two little girls, when right in front of them, a man started having a seizure. He kind of stumbled and over his own feet and fall backwards. I see a train coming, but the train is so close, I'm like, what do I do? Wesley jumped onto the tracks and thought if he could just lie on top of the man, keep him from flailing, maybe the train would roll right over both of them. The clearance was exactly 21 inches. Wesley and the man, 20 and a half. No way the train can stop before this gentleman could get him, get him up off the tracks. So he covered him with his body and pushed him down to a point where the train wouldn't hit his head and held him down under the tracks while the train came and rolled right over the top of him. It gave Wesley's children the scare of their young lives. I thought he was going to get killed. And Wesley, the scare of his too. I'm like talking to him, sir, you can't move. I got two kids up here looking for the father to come back. I don't know you, you don't know me, but listen, don't panic. You know, I'm here to save you. As for the guy Wesley saved, He's 20-year-old Cameron Hollipter, and other than a few scrapes and bruises, his father says he's doing fine. Mr. Autry's instinctive and unselfish act saved our son's life. You know, the word hero gets thrown around a lot nowadays. What a better way to say to start off the new year than to save, save a life. <laughs> so one day, you're going to be in a new situation. And in that situation, the three paths. Path one, you're going to do perpetrative evil. You're going to spread gossip, you're going to spread lies, you're going to tell, tell racist, sexist jokes, you're going to bully. Path two is, you don't do it, you're just going to let it happen. Tacit approval, look the other way. But path three is, you go straight ahead and take the heroic path. Uh, and to do that, it means you simply have to be an ordinary person who makes a moral decision to help other people or to change a bad situation. And so the point is, can we really begin to promote in our children, in us, in your training, the whole notion that we all have the potential, not only for evil, which I try to demonstrate, but we have the equal potential to be heroes. And when the time comes, if you don't act, know that it may never happen again. In all your life, you'll know, I could have been a hero, and I let it pass by. And that's the thing that, that we don't want to happen. So the important thing is to think it, and go beyond thinking it, and then do it. So I want to end with some advice to the brigade. 
It's important to respect just authority, but it's important to defy unjust authority. Hard decision to make. And you, are de you deal with authority all the time. Everybody, is, everybody above you is an authority. And some of them deserve your respect, and others do not. And how do you make that distinction? It's important to obey orders, of course. Everything about is, here is about orders. But you have to do it mindfully. Some orders do not deserve to be obeyed. And there's enough, enough examples from, from Iraq, from Haditha, from Marines, obeying mindlessly uh, unjust orders. You have to be personally account accountable for your orders. You're going to be giving orders to other people. And when those orders are wrong, you have to be accountable for them. It's not enough to say, I'll be responsive. You're responsible, you're also accountable. And again, it's important not to yield to group pressures when you believe they're wrong. It's important sometimes to say, I don't care if they don't like me, if they don't accept me. I think this is wrong and I have to oppose it. Do not allow yourself to be de-individuated, to be made anonymous. You are always a special person. And that's critical to remember, who am I? Even if I'm in a uniform, even if I look like everybody in this line, I am still a special person. The important thing is never dehumanize your enemy. Even though you want to kill them and they want to kill you, that's what war is about. Once you dehumanize your enemy, once you think of them as less than human, you know what? You rape their women, you kill their children, you massacre, you, you destroy, as we saw, mutilate. There used to be an old code of soldier honor. You on, soldiers honor one another as warriors, and you don't dehumanize. Once you, once you allow your mind to develop that cortical cataract, then you don't want to kill. You want to go beyond kill. You want to destroy them in, in, in horrible ways. So the important thing is respect the humanity of, of the opposition. Again, admit your error. Apologize. Fix it so it won't happen again. Move on and don't waste time justifying it. The human mind can justify any evil. Question ideology that supports illegal and moral means to uh, good ends. And last, no, and diffusion responsibility is always unacceptable because it means no one is accountable. And last, be a hero to your nation, but most of all, first to your mama. If we can get the last slide. Thank you very much. Wait, oh shoot. <laughs> One more, come on, one, do it. <laughs> okay, let's suppose systems of evil power at home and abroad advocate for respect of personal dignity, justice, and peace. Thank you. Dr. Zimbardo will now entertain a few questions from the audience. Do they have micro? Yeah, right. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Midshipman, second class, Mateo, 13th Company. <clears throat> At the academy, we're taught to be accountable for our <laughs> actions and to hold other people accountable for theirs. But it seems to me that the idea of no bad apples, only bad barrels, alleviates the individual of responsibility. <coughs> as it is their circumstances, uh, not their moral character, that is the base cause for their actions. My question is, if there are no bad apples, only bad barrels, how can we be expected to hold people accountable for their actions, especially in situations when changing out the barrel may not be a viable option? Great question. Great question. Um, the, I didn't say there were no bad apples. I just said we have to, dis I, it's a hypothesis. In any given situation, is, in it, is it the apple or is it the barrel? In some cases, there are bad apples. they are really bad people. Uh, and we have to understand who they are. The problem is, if we always run to, it's always the actor and not the situation, we err in that we can never then change the situation if that's the cause. I want to argue, I'm using the Stanford Prison Study, I'm using Abu Ghraib, I'm using the Milgram Study to say, here are people we know at time one were good, and at time two were doing horrible things. 